Today on the show, why Vladimir Putin is probably loving the fact that The Rock has been told he's not black enough to play a black person. Welcome to the future, where the glass is half full and you'll need new glasses, where you'll be jumping from conclusions. The past is known, and a new future is born. Never before in history has so much meant so little to so many. A.D. on the radio. So, you know, this might seem a scotch silly, and maybe it was, I, I don't know. Especially bearing in mind how this particular art form has prog- progressed. I'm sure I would be decimated if I were to step on stage and pick up a mic and take somebody on now. Not only am I woefully out of practice, but also, man, people have gotten so good over the years. But I used to I used to rap battle. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Go ahead. Get it out. Get, get your yuck yucks out now. But I, yeah, I used to rap battle when I was a kid. When I was a teenager... I took hip hop music very, 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 very seriously. I mean, still do the stuff that I really appreciate, the stuff that I enjoy. But I used to rap battle. Now, you may or may not have heard me talk about this in the past before, but I I grew up in London. I moved to England when I was a kid, grew up there, and was there until I was a young adult when my band, which was an obnoxious rap metal group... (laughs) We were signed and managed by all the same people that looked after Corn and Limp Bizkit and Linkin Park and all those bands. Needless to say, we were the one band did not that did not sell 10 million copies, but nevertheless had a good time toward the world. It was, it was a super awesome way to grow up, I suppose. It was sort of like my version of going to college. Everybody else went to college. I got a record deal when I was a teenager. And, well, I look back on my time in a band touring the world as... Well, in a very similar manner to that, which a lot of people look back on their college years, which is, boy, (laughs) that was stupid. But we had some fun and we learned some stuff. But previous to joining this band and getting the record deal and all that sort of stuff, I, I, I was a rapper. I fancied myself a rapper. And to be fair, I wasn't bad just because, well, I played drums since I was four years old. So I was very rhythmically aware, I suppose you could call it. So I was a halfway decent rapper by today's standards. Like I said, the art form has progressed like you wouldn't believe. Did you know there's pay-per-view rap battles now? And people are just insane with it. Unbelievable. But at the time, I was uh, at the top of the heap. And I know this because I used to battle pretty much every single week. I would go to this one club, The Underworld. And... Or was it the Underworld? I can't remember. It was was a Tottenham Court Road stop on the Tube. What was that place called? I I don't know. Unless you were in London in the 90s, then I'm going to guess you don't know either. But I was this teenager, and I would go to this hip-hop club. A buddy of mine used to run sort of like a hip-hop club slash open mic night, and he invited me out one evening. I was like, oh, this is great. This is fantastic. And... I remember going, you, you're going to battle rap? Oh, I would like to battle rap. And it was the strangest thing. I got some cultural side eye for being the white guy that was rapping. Now, this was, I suppose, before there were a ton of white rappers doing their thing. And I don't think anyone had really broken big being a white rapper in England anyway trying to think I mean there's obviously Vanilla Ice and oh there's House of Pain and then uh, anyways it was the exception rather than the rule that a a white guy would be allowed to battle rap at this club I was pretty much the only white guy that went and when it turned out that I was going to battle rap with other MCs yo I got some side eye I really did But you want to know what made it go away? Uh, You want to know what made it go away? The incredulity over my whiteness was the fact that I was from New York, ostensibly the home of hip hop. I was a person that grew up in England, but originally I was from New York. I had an American accent. And uh, uh, like I said, whenever uh, they got used to me eventually, but at this club, 
when I decided that I was going to battle rap, I got some side eye. I got some incredulous looks. I got some th- really white kid is going to. OK, well, all right, let's see how this goes. And uh, they're like uh, and coming up on this corner. Where are you from, sir? Well, I'm from New York. Oh, oh, snap. Oh, damn. Oh, an American MC from New York, the home of hip hop. And all of a sudden, because of my New York roots or what they perceived to be my New York roots, I was taken more seriously as a rapper. And to me, the whole thing was a scotch silly. It really was. The idea that something like music could be viewed as a divisive thing was strange to me. The idea that the competitive nature of a rap battle (laughs) was not for everyone was strange to me. Because I'd always viewed music as being a meritocracy. If you were good, great. If you weren't, does not matter where you come from, who you are, the color of your skin. Music, like I said, meritocracy. And I remember that was sort of the first time, and and by the way, I battled, I think, pretty much every Tuesday night for the better part of a year, and uh, rarely, um, rarely did I lose. Like I said, I was quite rhythmically aware. I was reasonably good, creative. I mean, today, I still have a bit of a way with words. It's sort of how I make the vast majority of my living. So apply that to the hip hop form. And I did okay. I did. I, I mean, I don't think I was really up against anybody who was all that good, but nevertheless, I dealt with all this sort of like side eye, this cultural inc- incredulity that I was a white rapper in England, which I thought was ridiculous. And I thought it was equally as ridiculous that they took me seriously once they found out I was from New York. They're like, oh, East Coast style. I'm like, sure, whatever, go ahead, You're fine. It, it, if that's whatever floats your boat, great. I didn't think that I should be given a hard time for being white, nor did I think that I should be given a pass for being from the East Coast of America. But I do remember feeling kind of sad about the whole thing because I remember thinking, A, no, this stuff should matter, and B, B, Music is one of those things that should bring people together. Things like music, culture, style, food. These should never be things that drive people apart. This should be some of the glue that unifies us as a people. And I was reminded of this when I found out what happened to The Rock over a new movie role. Did you see this? Like I said... These are the things that should bring us together, not divide us. We'll get into it next. Real radio, 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 radio. One hundred four point one. Where the left and right come together for fundamental truths. AD on the radio on Twitter at adsxe. So, you know, art, culture, food, music, these, I think, and I think you'll agree, are wonderful tools for bringing people together. There's a reason why food brings people together. There's a reason why people refer to breaking bread as a bonding experience. Food brings people together. Art brings people together. You can be moved to tears. Buy something, a painting hanging on a wall, a drawing, a book, something that bonds us all together in the realization of the human experience. You can be bonded together by art. You can find common ground in food, in music, in style. Music's an interesting one because music works on a level that we don't fully understand. Like scientists have for years and years attempted to understand the emotional, physical, and spiritual ways that music can affect us. The fact that music can move us to tears, the fact that chords and notes arranged in a certain structure in a certain order have the ability to affect us in an emotional manner the way nothing else on this planet can is something that not even science has a real explanation for. 
Music's an incredible thing. You put some songs on, doesn't matter who you are, what color your skin is, where you go to work, how you were brought up, what language you speak. None of these things matter. You put a certain record on, your butt is going to move. And it's a beautiful bonding thing to be <laughs> to be brought together over the common ground of what makes your booty quake. It's great stuff. But like I said, while music is this incredible agent of unity among people, I was sort of surprised when I was a kid, all into rapping, that I got some side eye for being a white rapper. I would go to this club, this buddy of mine, this black guy that I grew up hanging out with in England, he put on a club night. And he was like, he was just my friend. I, I never really once gave any thought to color coming in to rap music. I hadn't. There was Beastie Boys and Run DMC. And these two groups were absolutely everything to me. When I was a kid, young, young child, like six years old, I was exposed to their music. And those are the only rap groups that I knew about initially. I was like, oh, there's one white one, one black one. I, I didn't give it any thought. I did not give the racial property divide that became so, so commonplace in rap music later any thought when I discovered hip hop music. I just knew I loved Beastie Boys. I knew I loved Run DMC. I thought it was the greatest thing that I'd ever heard. And you know, as a child at that age, I did not relate to sappy love songs. I didn't. I, I hadn't started dating yet. And you hear all these songs on the radio about being in love or being sad because the love of your life left you or whatever. The, the relationship aspect of music and lyrics, I, I certainly didn't understand. But the sort of self-aggrandizing, self-proclaiming aspect of saying that you're the greatest that's ever been of all time of all time. Well, I got that. And before you have relationships <laughs> with the objects of your affection, you have a desire to win. A sixth grader, like a kid, a six year old kid understands that. So when I heard Run DMC say <laughs> that they were the best, and I heard BC Boys say were the best, I, I really responded to, I suppose, the competitive, aspirational nature of rap music. Race never once entered into it. Those were the two bands that I was exposed to. I remember my father came back from America. He was like, there's this thing called rap music, and these are apparently the uh, best at it. This is Run DMC, and these are Beastie Boys. I thought you might enjoy it. You play drums, uh, you might respond to it. Seems very rhythmic. I always thank my dad for introducing me to uh, <laughs> rap music. I know, weird gateway, right? Very strange. Uh, an English man on a business trip brought me my first rap tapes and changed my life. Not exactly the most street version of coming up in the hip hop game, but nevertheless, that's how I discovered something that meant absolutely everything to me. But the racial component of rap music didn't, didn't figure it in all. It didn't give it any thought. And so when this black friend of mine who was putting on hip hop nights said, why, why don't you come down? Why don't you uh, hang out? Be fun. Uh, of course I did. I was the only white guy there. Didn't really think about that aspect of it. I was very fortunate. I was super fortunate growing up because like my parents, my parents did a really, really good job at never treating anybody differently for any reason whatsoever. My parents did a really, really good job of raising me in a world where prejudice didn't exist. The only downside of that was that it was a bit of a shock when I got out into the real world outside of my narrow youthful existence and discovered that racism, prejudice, divides, all these things were a thing. And I, I was not equipped necessarily to understand them or deal with them because my parents had raised me under the assumption that they don't exist because they shouldn't exist at the end. So I was surprised. I was surprised when I was the subject of some prejudice. Walking into this club, I'd been working on my rhymes for quite some time, and uh, I wanted to give them a go. I wanted to go to this club, and I wanted to rap battle. And like I said, people went, oh, really, white boy, you, you got to do that? And I was given a hard time for being white. But then 
immediately, as quickly as I was given a hard time for being white, that all went away when I announced I was from New York. <laughs> oh, what the, okay, then it's okay for you to rap. And I remember, you know, I would go rap, I, I would rap battle, I would, <laughs> I, I guess as close as that club had to, as that close as that, uh, was there a winner declared? I think I was, I, I don't know. It wasn't super formal, but I would battle and often, uh, oftentimes I was perceived as the winner and it was a great old time. But I remember feeling sad because I remember thinking that music is something that brings people together. Music is something that we can all understand. Music is something that, well, you, you shouldn't need to be a certain color of skin to enjoy. And I get it. I understand. I understand that the pride of ownership that white people take for granted is something that has not necessarily been afforded to people that are not white over the years. It's why you get clothing brands like FUBU. For us, by us. Hey, not yours. <laughs> Ours. Got it. Understood. But music, culture, food, art, these are such incredible, powerful tools for bringing people together that I was just shocked, aghast, and saddened that A, I would be made to feel like I didn't belong, and B, the thing that would make people feel feel like I belonged was the fact that I was from a specific part of the world originally. Stupid. Silly. I thought it was then. I believe it is today. Man, you know another thing? There, <laughs> and strangely enough, back then, back then, people didn't have a problem with it. Maybe it was an English thing because there were a lot of English people with dreadlocks. The sort of, they, they called it the crusty or new age traveler scene. And that involved an awful lot of white people with dreads. But for uh, a couple of horrendously ill-advised weeks, I had dreads. I also had cornrows <laughs> for a little bit. I know, I know. Go on, get your yuck yucks out. I had long hair and when I was in a band, I, I needed something that would help me control it a little bit more. I was always sucking it down my throat on stage and getting it caught. So like before I wound up hacking it all off, I had dreads for a little bit, did not look good, but I had them and I had cornrows and I was attempting to be like Dexter Holland from the offspring. Remember he used to have like long cornrows and nobody made a big deal of it. Now, if you're a white guy with dreads or a white guy with cornrows, oof, you are appropriating culture and that's not cool. And that's, that's a damn shame because like I said, art, culture, music, style, these are things that can be used as agents of change to bring people together. It shouldn't be a divisive thing. And there's going to be people who say, you don't understand, that's appropriating a culture that is not yours. And that, uh, explain to me where there's malice in that, because there's not. And what well, we're seeing a version of this happen today with The Rock, who is apparently not black enough to play a black man. True story. Full story next. For more stimulation and less irritation, 9 out of 10 doctors choose KPRC AM 950. Houston's more stimulating talk radio. Don't get the blues, get all the news. We mean all of you. Guys out there in Radio Land. All aboard! He's back. AD on the radio. Give it up, yeah. Give it up, yeah. So do you think it's racist what's going on with Rock and his new movie? Have you heard about this? Well, all right. We'll get into the specifics of it next. A lot of people saying that The Rock casting himself in a specific iconic black role is a racist thing to do because he's not black enough. Uh, we'll get into it shortly after Devin Fields discuss, discusses the show on the History Channel that he finds to be the most racist of all. I recently discovered what I believe to be the most racist show on television. It's a show called Ancient Aliens. Uh, I don't know, there's some fans here, but if you don't know it, Ancient Aliens is a show on the History Channel. A name that which, with each passing day means less and less. <laughs> and on this show, they talk to scientists and the scientists discuss the, uh, the ruins of ancient civilizations, like pyramids and stuff. And they explain how they were probably left there by aliens. 
And I think this is deeply racist because the entire math of this show is just white people looking at the ruins of ancient non-white civilizations <laughs> and going, you think brown people made that? <laughs> no. I have a much simpler explanation. <laughs> Aliens from outer space came down. You think the Incas mastered stonemasonry to that degree? Absolutely not. No. White aliens from outer space. Same. So like I said, The Rock is apparently not black enough to play the role that he casts himself in. It takes an awful lot for me to say political correctness has run amok. But, uh, and by the way, as someone who is not just white, but incredibly, incredibly white, I'm not necessarily a person in a position to speak about this, but this might be a case of political correctness run, run amok. The other day, Dwayne The Rock Johnson announced he was going to play John Henry. Are you familiar with the story of John Henry? John Henry is a character from American folklore who raced against a steam engine to prove that he could dig a tunnel faster. And then he died after winning the contest. Now, here's the thing. This is a, well, it could be kind of interesting. I think it's going to be for Netflix. It's not going to be a retelling of that John Henry story. The Rock said that his John Henry will, quote, lead an ensemble cast of the most popular folklore figures and legends from different cultures around the world. That's if it happens at all. So, do you remember when The Rock was on Saturday Night Live and was talking about running for president? He said, hey, uh, nobody knows what... It was, some, it was really clever. He said, nobody knows... I'll get the ethnic vote because nobody knows what I am and everybody thinks I'm just what the hell they are. But were you aware of The Rock's ethnicity? The Rock is half Samoan and half black. And apparently, that's not black enough for some people for him to play John Henry. The internet freaking blew up over this news, saying that it's absolutely inappropriate that he plays John Henry because his skin is too light and he hasn't done enough to identify as black. Yes, The Rock is not identified as black enough in his life, not as an actor. Meaning when The Rock isn't on screen, he hasn't... Uh, he hasn't identified as black enough to justify going on screen pretending to be a mythical character from folklore who happens to be black, even though he is half black. Now, okay. Uh, no word about this chaos yet from The Rock. Are, are we becoming too sensitive, do you think? Like I said, art, art culture, music, food... These are things that have incredible unifying abilities. Yet people seem to be so hell-bent on being divided at all costs that, well, <laughs> this becomes a problem. The Rock is half black, not black enough. Scarlett Johansson wasn't allowed to play a transgender person. So there's that. And, and I wonder where the turning point came because Jared Leto, Jared Leto played a transgender person in Dallas Buyers Club, I think. Was that the movie? Won an Oscar. Lauded for his courage and bravery. And when it was announced that Scarlett Johansson was going to be pretending to be something that she's not, which is, you know, basically what actors do man oh man oh man did the internet light her up for it and initially initially her representatives kind of took the stance that hey if you want to talk to um someone about a person who isn't transgender playing a transgender person talk to jared leto maybe he's done polishing his uh, his oscar that he got for the role and he's willing to entertain this nonsense that was the uh, that was a direction of the defense that Scarlett Johansson's representatives took when initially this was leveled against her, that she was stealing a job that should have gone to an actual transgender person. 
we talked about this a lot on the show, and I I don't even remember the name of the movie, but I don't think the movie is going to get made now because they lost their star. And, well, to me, that that was a desperately sad thing because, well, and again, this is something that we've dealt with an awful lot in the past, but if you look at the suicide rate for straight Americans. It almost doubles if you happen to be gay. And then it doubles again to a level of, I think, around 50% if you happen to be transgender. That's a horrible, awful, terrible thing. And anything that leads to the normalization of people's experience to the point where they don't feel as apt to want to try and kill themselves is a good thing. So transgender stories being told, I think, in pop culture is vitally important because it can it can make it something that people are less scared of. And, well, there was one very big story that will never be told now because Scarlett Johansson was divested of the role by the politically correct internet police. I think it's a shame. I do. And I think it's a shame that, well, The Rock is being given a hard time for not being black enough because his skin isn't dark enough. And these are the comments on the interwebs. People saying, um, yeah, John Henry is The Rock. John Henry was a dark-skinned black man, not light-skinned, and The Rock hasn't identified as black during his time off the screen Wow. Just wow. Reading a tweet. But it's sad. It's really sad to me that things like, oh, we were talking about this a little while ago. Jamie Oliver, he had jerk chicken or no jerk rice. It was jerk rice, the English chef jerk rice. And because it didn't use one specific spice that a lot of people consider to be integral to jerk cooking, he was culturally appropriating jerk cooking slapping a jerk label on his product in order to sell more. He was politically incorrect because he left out a spice in his cooking. And he was like, "Da, I'm influenced by all sorts of cultures and all sorts of cooking all over the world. And th- what the hell did I just, I taste like jerk cooking to me. Da, Okay. Cult and culture, art, food, Movies, music, during a time where we desperately need to be united, these things have a power to unite people. And people are so hellbent, hellbent on being divided that, well, we're losing a real chance to come together in these situations. It's almost like the left. And by the way, I'm just here for this show. I don't fall down on the left or the right. And if you listen to the show for any length of time, you know this to be the case. Things are not black and white. There are many shades of gray, and in the gray is where you find the truth more often than not. I don't subscribe to a simple narrative for simple people, and I wholeheartedly endorse you not doing that either. So I'm really just here for the show when it comes to seeing how ridiculous either political party or either side of the political divide are acting. There was a time when the right was going through what the left is going through now. So divided. There was a time where nobody thought anyone from the right would ever get elected ever again because the right couldn't get on the same page. The right were at each other's throats. There were people going, you're a rhino. You're a Republican in name only. You're you're not Republican or right wing enough. You establishment Republican. You might as well just slap a D on yourself and be done with it. Remember that level of infighting that was happening on the right? Just sort of like a year, two, three and a half. Uh, It it was going on for a while now and still is to some extent, but there's a lot less of it. Well, it seems like the left is having their own moment with that now. On the radio. That's what's 
So, yeah, The Rock, who is half black, is being told that he is not black enough to play John Henry. People are all sorts of upset that Dwayne The Rock Johnson has cast himself as John Henry in the, I think, Netflix production of John Henry and the Statesman. Like I said, if you're unfamiliar with the story, John Henry is this African-American folk hero who, as a steel driver, raced against a steam machine and won... Losing his life in the process, though. Johnson said on Instagram, The Rock said on Instagram, he's excited to play one of his childhood heroes in this upcoming Netflix film. Oh, yeah, it is Netflix. And will lead a cast of the most popular folklore figures and legends from different cultures around the world. He said, the legend of John Henry's strength, endurance, dignity, and cultural pride was instilled in my DNA at a very young age. My dad would sing Big John to me every time he would put me to bed. And you know, who could have seen this one coming? Not The Rock, I'm guessing, because you read what he wrote with regard to his excitement for the movie. You read what he wrote about playing a folk hero a cultural folk hero, and bringing together other folk heroes from other cultures around the world. This was meant to be something that, well, I don't want to say panders, but this was meant to be something that brings together cultures, race, and ethnicities, and celebrates multiculturalism, I suppose. Sounds like they had a very keen eye on that multicultural dollar when they were getting ready to make the film. They wanted to do something unifying and the internet's jumped all over him saying, sorry, you're not black enough to play this black folk hero. You're too light skinned is what he's being told. Now, look, as a white guy, not just a white guy, but an incredibly white guy, a white English guy, a guy who's basically a mixture of English, Scandinavian, German, And what was the other one? I don't know. I forget. This stuff doesn't mean that much to me. But uh, there's no one more white than me. So perhaps it's silly for me to be speaking about this. But it really does seem that people are so hell-bent on division, especially on the left. Now, the right went through this a few years ago. Donald Trump, as paradoxical and divisive of a figure as he is, seems to have united what's going on with the right side of the political aisle. Like, I think in a lot of ways, the right are just happy that they won. (laughs) You know, I think a lot of the division that they were experiencing was because some people felt as though they were never going to win unless they had a candidate that was right wing enough. Do you remember a couple of years ago? It seemed like there was no way, no way the right were ever going to get anything done because of the constant infighting. It just was impossible for the right to get on the same page. That's where the term rhino came from. You Republican in name only. Why not just slap a big D on your forehead and call yourself what you are, you Democrat? And then there were people that were far right saying, huh. Certainly, certainly I would never vote for any kind of establishment Republican. They're just Democrats in disguise. And that, that was rife among the right. And it looked like they were never going to be able to get on the same page. But now they won. You know, the Republican candidate became president. And they seem to be, like I said, a little bit more unified. Cut two, the left is now dealing with its own factions of extremism, saying that, oh, you're no, you're nowhere near left enough. Case in point, the Antifa folks, the anti-fascist types. What was that rally? It was one in Portland. I think it was a Unite the White rally where a bunch of Antifa types beat the living snot out of a Bernie Sanders 
supporter for not being left wing enough. Oh, this poor guy. This poor guy went to, and again, we talked about this on the show when it happened, but if you don't remember the story, this poor guy went to this rally to protest right wing extremism. There was some like white supremacist nonsense, some freaking knuckle dragging, you will not replace us morons getting together. I think it was in Portland and he showed up staunch Democrat, Bernie supporter with his American flag. And to him, the American flag was a symbol of unity and hope. And in some ways he was sort of taking it back, I suppose. Felt as though the American flag had been appropriated by people that were hateful and wanted to make sure that people knew that folks on the left were proud to be American as well. What a novel concept. There were some Antifa protesters there doing what they do, demanded his flag. He was like, what? No, you can't have my flag. This is my flag. I I bought it. It's mine. I'm not going to get that. Whack! Beat the living snot out of this guy. Took his flag and left him bleeding on the ground. The Antifa folks beat the crap out of a Bernie Sanders supporter because he wasn't lefty enough. Maybe... Maybe it does go hand in hand with loss. Maybe the division goes hand in hand with loss. When Obama was president, the right were blaming each other because they lost again two terms in a row. Ah, geez. Must be your fault. Must be your fault. Oh, wait, our guy won? Well, we can all get along again. And I guess that would logically dictate that people on the left... When they lost, well, they would start looking around for people to blame. I mean, there's tremendous division still between Bernie Sanders supporters and Hillary Clinton supporters. And there's so many Bernie boosters that will tell you that Bernie Sanders would be president if Hillary Clinton was in such a dirty, cheating scoundrel and all this sort of stuff. Like, there's still plenty of that to go around. I guess it's the loss that brings the division. I don't know. I do know this, though. It is a tremendously disappointing time where we are so... Divided, not just among ourselves, left and right, <laughs> but when, but when people within their own parties can't get on the same page, it's sad, because ultimately we're all on the same side. And these seeds of division that exist between us, whether it's between left and right, or left and not left enough, or right and not right enough, you know who they help? Not us. They help the enemies of America. They help the Kim Jongs and the Vladimirs and folks like that who are looking for some higher ground, an upper hand in these situations. Who are looking to play us. Who are looking to get the better of us, whether it comes in the form of trade or in the form of weaponizing or de-weaponizing. This is why... (laughs) This is why a lot of the dissent over that last Jedi movie being too left-leaning, a lot of the online dissent was sown by Russian bots. There is genuine currency to our enemies in our division. The more we fail to get along, the more we quibble and argue about whether or not The Rock is black enough to play a black person. The more we argue about these things, the more we are divided, the more we let ourselves be divided about these indulgences, these th- the indulgences, these things that don't really matter, the more we play into the hands of our enemies. I don't know how many more times I have to say it. I don't know how many more ways I can say it, but I'll keep saying it because it's so important, so important for you, for me, for all of us. That somewhere, at some point, we managed to get on the same page. Thank you so much. <laughs> 